Thank you, Crystal. Appreciate that. Starting to get more and more talent in our church for special music. Maybe we'll have to have a combined thing one of these days. That's great. Thank you. In 1907, Anna Jarvis from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, began a campaign to establish a National Mother's Day. Ms. Jarvis persuaded her mother's church in Grafton, West Virginia, to celebrate Mother's Day on the second anniversary of her mother's death, the second Sunday of May. By the next year, Mother's Day was also celebrated in Philadelphia. Ms. Jarvis and her supporters began to write to ministers, businessmen, politicians in their quest to establish a national Mother's Day. It was successful as by 1911, Mother's Day was celebrated in almost every state, only four years later. President Woodrow Wilson in 1914 made the official announcement proclaiming Mother's Day as a national holiday that would be held each year on the second Sunday of May. That day is tomorrow. We will be celebrating Mother's Day for all of you mothers in the room. Turn with me, if you would, to Titus. Titus, right after Timothy, where we did spend a lot of time at the, council, at the GCE. Titus 2, to begin with today. Can I get a water from somebody, please? I want to share a cute summary about mothers that I found on the Internet. It's entitled, What My Mother Taught Me. My mother taught me about religion. When I spilled grape juice on the carpet, she instructed, you better pray the stain comes out of that carpet. My mother taught me about logic. When I asked her why she wanted me to do something, it was her decisive words, because I said so. That's why. My mother taught me about foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. My mother taught me about irony. Keep laughing and I'll give you something to cry about. My mother taught me about stamina. You'll sit there until you finish that spinach. My mother taught me about the weather. It looks as if a tornado swept through your room. My mother taught me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. My mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. Thank you. My mother taught me about envy. There are millions of less fortunate children in this world who do not have a wonderful mom like me. Thanks, mom. Okay, let's look at Titus and see what Timothy has to, or Titus, yeah, Timothy has to, or Paul has to say to Titus about what's going on with women here. Paul will provide us with some insight of God's perspective as to women overall. We'll see Paul giving advice to the ladies of the church and how to behave and live as a godly woman, the type of woman that all of us would like to be celebrating tomorrow on Mother's Day. Let's begin in Titus 2, beginning in verse 3. Titus 2, verse 3. The older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So we see that Paul starts with the older women of the congregation, the older women of the church. Paul starts by admonishing them to be a certain way in the congregation. He tells them he wants them to be reverent in their behavior. This actually means holy, proper, so as to be a good example to people around them. He said he admonishes them not to be slanderers. He doesn't want the older women to be someone who talks about other people. He also points out that they shouldn't be having consumers of alcohol. Be sober. Enjoy it, but don't overdo it. But they should also be teachers of the good things of being a good Christian. This is what Paul said to the congregation when he started addressing women. He said the older women should have these characteristics because they're going to play an enormous role in the congregation. Let's pick it up in verse 4. 
Paul points out that these older women should do this and live this way of life for a special reason. So that, verse 4, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, to be chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. The older women were advised by Paul so that they may specifically teach the younger women how to live their lives. But it's interesting what he says at the tail end of verse 5. He said he wants them to do all these things so that the word of God may not be blasphemed. You see, the way women relate to the church, the way older women relate to the younger women, the way all women relate to individuals that they congregate with can have a direct impact on the way God looks at them. He said they should do all of this so that all of them live their lives a certain way so that God will not be blasphemed. It's a mockery of God when the family structure doesn't operate the way God intended it to. And part of that structure are the women or the mothers and the wives in that structure. You could say that they, the older women, the older women should possess and disseminate the principles, should possess and disseminate the principles of being a godly woman. Turn over to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. What I want to do is take a look at these principles of a godly woman that Paul outlined here, that the older women should have and disseminate to the younger women. 